information based on our guest speaker stories and experiences, which we believe will be helpful to all parents, guardians, and medical practitioners watching our live event right now. So now, let me introduce our first local guest speaker. He is a graduate of University of Santo Tomas, College of Medicine and Surgery. He completed his otolaryngology head and neck surgery residency training program at University of Santo Tomas Hospital. He then went abroad to further pursue his fellowship that specializes in the field of pediatric otolaryngology at Harvard Medical School and State University of New York from 2003 to 2007. He is currently an active consultant and a pediatric otolaryngologist to three prestigious hospitals here in the Philippines. Without further ado, let us all welcome Dr. Angelo Monroy. Okay, uh, thank you for the warm welcome, Dr. Joel. I also welcome everyone who is currently watching this live. We are happy to have everyone here. It's a great pleasure to be here and to share my knowledge about pediatric healing care. For this discussion, we will focus on pediatric hearing loss. and It's important why this must be taught to our audience, especially about the hearing health of our children. I prepared a brief presentation, especially for the parents who are currently watching right now, so everyone can easily take notes about tonight's topic. Okay, so let's begin with our lecture. So it's entitled Pediatric Hearing Loss, Common Causes and Management. Next slide, please. So there are commonly encountered issues resulting in hearing loss. Number one, we have the earwax or impacted sermon. Number two, we have the noise-induced hearing loss, uh, particularly about headphones and earphones. And three, ear infection or otitis media. And I'm sorry, there's a number four. It's about congenital hearing loss. Okay, next slide, please. So regarding earwax, uh, there are symptoms of having excessive earwax. They present as having uh, ear blockage, sometimes ear pain, sometimes uh, ringing in the ear, sometimes itchiness in the ear, mm -hmm. coughing, which results as a cough reflex when the ear gets stimulated. Uh, there's the Arnold's nerve, which triggers a cough reflex. Um, patients having discharge, patients having dizziness, and patients having some weird odor coming from the ear may sometimes signify excessive earwax. Next slide, please. So earwax can lead to significant hearing loss, especially uh, when it is completely occluded. So the hearing loss can range from about five to about 40 decibels, depending on the degree of occlusion of the canal within the, uh, with the cerumen. Next slide, please. So to manage earwax, uh, we can actually soften up the wax, especially among children, because we never want to make it an unpleasant uh, experience for them. So we soften them up for at least three to five days before flushing it with, with uh, water. Uh, I prefer this method because using a rigid instrumentation can sometimes irritate or even cause pain among children. And they would mark you or you get imprinted in their lives because of that. And next slide, please. So this is a, a picture of uh, before and after uh, wax removal. So you could see on the Left side, you have a totally occluded ear canal with wax. Then after flushing, you could visibly see your eardrums already. Next slide, please. So uh, the next uh, issue I would like to discuss is about headphones or earphones. Uh, in particular, it's about noise-induced hearing loss. Next slide. So the, some facts to know about hearing loss is the third most common problem in the United States. I mean, the health problem. Uh, then a lot of our devices would actually have the capability of producing 100 decibels or more, and that would injure our, our hearing eventually. Uh, and uh, among patients uh, between the age of 6 to about 19 years old, there's about a 12 to 15 percent incidence of having uh, varying degrees of hearing loss. Uh, and also um, in 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 um, uh, having a hearing loss because of a very loud volume, like 85 decibels and above, it's not recommended to have like a, a volume 
in your headphones using using that um, volume. So next slide, please. So about uh, headphones and earphones, actually, this is a chart where you could actually see uh, the um, various um, decibels or volume levels. So for example, the uh, 70 to 80 decibels is actually like an alarm clock. Uh, conversation is actually about uh, 60, 70 decibels. And the loud sounds would actually be like uh, you know, the rifle shot, ambulance siren, or jet engine. This is about 100 plus or more. Um, next slide, please. So for the past 30 years, uh, there's an increasing popularity of amplified sounds, especially among portable instrumentation. And this is actually very significant in producing uh, noise-induced hearing loss. Uh, and now it is a uh, general public health issue. And um, this noise-induced hearing loss can range from mild to moderate uh, levels, which cannot be immediately be apparent to the child. Next slide, please. So this can lead to significant communication challenges, um, such as delayed language development, social isolation, and this can actually be um, uh, factor in missing crucial information at school, and this would equate to a diminished educational achievement and eventually you will have less uh, opportunity uh, later in life. So next slide. So signs that you are having uh, hearing loss, actually it's difficulty understanding uh, what your, your um, other person is saying, especially in a noisy environment. Uh, this is a sign, uh, persistent ringing or tinnitus in the ear. And also when you notice your child is asking what almost frequently whenever you're talking to them. And um, when you notice them using a volume higher than normal when listening to the TV or when you hear the sounds emanating from their headphones, it means it's too loud. And uh, next slide, please. And uh, there's a mechanism in, in noise-induced hearing loss why it damages the ear. So as you know, sound waves are actually energy and when, when they hit your hearing organ, it, it might damage the, the inner hair cells, uh, specifically, uh, next slide please, specifically the nerve cells, they have a myelin sheet, but when they're exposed to uh, constant vibration, you, you tend to lose them, they get stripped of the myelin sheet, and it is very important, this uh, myelin sheet to conduct the nerve impulse from the cochlea, your hearing organ, after your brain, so you lose that whenever you get a prolonged exposure to loud noises. And um, uh, this is just so important uh, whenever you are exposed to these very loud sounds. Next slide, please. So how to manage noise induced hearing loss. So just avoid noise exposure. And when you have them, of course, hearing aid devices. Next slide, please. And uh, here's our recommended headphone use. There's a time limit of about 60 minutes and the volume should not be more than 60% of the maximum level. Next slide, please. So uh, the third uh, common issue about uh, hearing loss in among pediatric patients is about ear infection or otitis media. As in this picture, it is depicted that you have a eustachian tube that connects your nasopharyngeal airspace to your ear. It is actually smaller and narrower in children. That's why they are more prone to get infected to to accumulate fluid compared to an adult. Next slide, please. And when you have like um, uh, fluid inside your middle ear, these act like a very good medium for germs to, to propagate and to cause severe infection and eventually lead to other complications such as having your perforated eardrums. Next slide, please. So uh, among these pictures are various stages of having ear infection. On your leftmost screen is actually a normal eardrum. On the second picture, you see an infected eardrum. It, it's uh, the color is not transparent anymore. It's very dull and it's uh, getting red because of angrier blood vessels. And on the third picture, you have a uh, glue ear. It's actually sometimes a sterile fluid which is trapped behind the eardrum, so it renders hearing full. And um, it's a problem that. If you let it be for more than three months, there's a greater likelihood that you'd end up with a perforated eardrum, which is bad. 
So on the fourth uh, picture, you have a perforated drum and you could see some kind of drainage coming out. So aside from uh, giving you conductive loss, meaning your, your eardrums might get perforated or some of your bones inside your ear might get eroded, but also the, the pus inside your middle ear, they act like poisons to, to render your uh, inner ear incapable of transmitting nerve impulses. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, how does ear infection affect a child's hearing? So actually, when you have some kind of fluid in your ear, uh, you could easily lose about 24 decibels. That's about the volume of a soft whisper. But if your fluid inside your middle ear is thick, you could lose as much as 45 decibels. That's uh, a level uh, approximating a normal conversational speech. Next slide, please. So uh, again, about ear infection, when you have CSOM or chronic superiorative otitis media, it's one of the most cr common chronic infections among children, common disease in children. Um, it's also actually the leading cause of acquired hearing loss. And uh, this hearing loss is actually a public health problem in both developed and developing countries. Next slide, please. So management is control of upper respiratory tract infection, eustachian tube dysfunction, which is their main problem. You have to dry up the eustachian tube for your ear to ventilate properly and avoid complications. And uh, when you have this infection, try to avoid swimming or other water sporting activities because they tend to aggravate the infection. And of course, if you could uh, delay air travel because uh, when you have secretions trapped inside your ear, you're gonna be a hard time in adjusting to uh, pressure changes within the cabin. So if you can't delay your, your travel, actually we would advise you to take decongestants at least 30 minutes before your flight. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And so um, the management of ear infections, uh, most of them are viral, but some end up with bacterial infections. So we give antibiotics, mm -hmm. especially for those with moderately symptomatic patients and the common uh, pathogens that you see uh, are strep pneumonia, non-typable haemophilus influenza, boxarella cataralis, and group A strep. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So the last uh, common issue that you see among patients uh, with uh, hearing loss is about congenital hearing loss. So it's hearing loss that is present at birth. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of um, causes. Uh, you may have a viral infection, rubella, herpes simplex, prematurity, low birth weight, um, birth injury, especially about uh, having uh, loss of oxygen that supplies you to the brain or anoxia, uh, drug or alcohol in, uh, induced problems during pregnancy. Um, jaundice is, is, is a, a big factor in, in hearing loss, uh, maternal diabetes, uh, high blood pressure during pregnancy or preeclampsia that actually compromises the blood supply in your placental circulation to the baby. Uh, and uh, of course, again, uh, anoxia. Uh, of course, the oxygen is very important in the nerve development. And of course, genetics or syndromic uh, problems. Uh, again, these are about genetics. These are issues about your patients. Uh, and about congenital hearing loss, uh, why do you need to address it? Why was the newborn hearing screening imposed? It's because it's one of the more common uh, congenital issues that happen more often than any other birth defect. So, uh, at present, it's about 28 or 30 um, cases per 10,000 live births. You could attribute to hearing loss. Uh, comparing it to a cleft lip palate, 12 out of 10,000 live births. And Down syndrome, 11 out of 10,000 live births. Again, next slide. And locally, here's the prevalence in the Philippines. Uh, in a study made in 2013, there's about 1.3 per 1,000 live births that you could attribute like total deafness. It means congenital, bilateral, permanent, profound hearing loss. And for other degrees of hearing loss, from unilateral mild to moderate hearing loss, it's as much as 22 uh, per 1,000 live births in, in the Philippines. It's, it's way, way high here in the country. So um, congenital hearing loss is screened using an auto-acoustic emission testing. So they test you twice. If, if you fail on both times, you would actually be uh, recommended to undergo uh, a barrier test. Next slide, please. So this is a more definitive test in uh, checking the hearing of your baby. 
Um, if you do this, uh, sometimes if too early, it might be just a prematurity, but you have to do this probably at least on the third month of age uh, to be really accurate. Next slide, please. And also when you detect that there is a hearing loss, you must find out what's causing it. So sometimes we would request for a CT scan or even an MRI. Uh, it's also important to prepare the patient preoperatively if ever uh, a cochlear implant is being thought of. Uh, just to make sure there is nothing wrong with the anatomy. Uh, next slide, please. And here's a picture of the hearing um, rehabilitation that we could do. Of course, hearing aid, although the, uh, their patient is still a baby, but having a sound stimulus can help actually in the brain development. Uh, there's a study comparing that the brain is smaller among very deaf patients compared to a normal individual. Uh, it's because the sound stimulus is a constant stimulation for brain development. And uh, the cochlear implant on the right, uh, this is a more um, complex way of addressing hearing loss, but it brings your patient back to, to a better opportunity, especially for school and later on opportunities in life. Next slide, please. So management is multidisciplinary. Uh, you have the neonatology, the, the doctors who see your, your baby the first 30 days. You have your pediatrics, you have your ENT, your otolaryngology, your audiologists are very important in measuring your, your hearing ability. Uh, the SLP or speech language pathologists, they're important in rehabilitating you how to speech, how to transfer your, your, your hearing cognition to, to speech, how to learn it. Uh, you have your ophthalmology or eye doctors, you have radiology to check the uh, radiologically abnormalities in your, uh, in, in your, in your baby your psychologist, because sometimes they have an impact on, on children, especially uh, as they grow up. And of course, the involvement of school and, and the family itself. So these are very important in um, addressing hearing loss in the pediatric age group. Next slide. I think that's uh, the end. Uh, I hope you learn a thing or two in this uh, lecture. Um, we tried making it very simple, but uh, let's see you later on in our question and answer portion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Angelo Monroy. We are so glad we have you here tonight to talk about pediatric hearing care. I'm sure our live viewers learned a lot from your discussion. As mentioned by Doc Angelo, in children, one of the most important signs of hearing loss is delayed speech and language development. It is important to take note of the child's inconsistent responses for other signs, such as sitting close to the television or increasing the volume of the TV at very loud levels. So there are several reasons why a child may have a hearing problem, including temporary hearing loss due to otitis media, which is the most common cause of hearing loss in children. It's usually secondary to an infected adenoids or even the common cold. That's why it is important to look out for any of the signs and symptoms and seek medical advice early testing will ensure that any hearing problem is diagnosed and managed accordingly as early as possible. I also agree with Dr. Munroy that cotton buds or Q-tips should never be used to remove impacted wax in children. Why? Because they may push the wax deeper into the ear canal. Also, since children have shorter ear canal using cotton buds may accidentally puncture the ear than if inserted too deeply. Okay, to our viewers, our comment section is open for your questions. Our team is taking note of all those questions to, so our guest speakers can personally answer them later. So go ahead and ask us anything about pediatric hearing care. After Dr. Angelo Monroy, we have another guest speaker who will join us tonight. She is an international pediatric audiologist and a product manager from Sonova Group, a Swiss company in Stafford that specializes in hearing care solutions. After university and completion of her German master diploma in, in audiology, she spent more than 10 years in private practice settings. Her experience ranges from practical hearing instrument fitting, pediatric assessment and rehabilitation, as well as teaching. For our, for our second and last guest speaker for tonight, let us, all, let us all welcome Ms. Barbara Munch. Hello, Ms. Barbara. Hi, Dr. Joel. I thank you so much for your amazing introduction. 
I also want to thank Manila Hearing Aid for giving me the opportunity to talk about pediatric hearing care and to share my experience about this topic to your audience, to your patients, to the doctors, to the people of the Philippines. I'm very grateful to have everyone here with us tonight. I will be talking about the essentials of managing children with hearing loss and why it is important to start as early as possible. I will also summarize the necessary components of how to deliver excellent hearing health care for children. If you could please uh, bring my first slide. Fitting hearing aids to children is one of the biggest challenges for a pediatric audiologist. Due to neonatal screenings, we receive our youngest clients earlier than ever before. With our decisions for hearing devices, we lay the foundations and we shape the future of the individual child. We have lots of responsibilities and duties, but we also have the best possible technologies in our hands. Today, I'd like to talk about what else will be needed to deliver best services for children. Next slide, please. Our ears are the doorway to the brain. Simply put, Hearing loss is a doorway problem that prevents auditory information from reaching the brain. It's the brain that processes and gives meaning to auditory information. For a child, any kind of hearing loss will cause issues with delivering enough information to the brain and therefore delaying the development of speech and language acquisition. Next slide, please. If we think about children in general, not just kids with hearing loss, we know that they have enormous amount to learn to help them succeed throughout their life. This isn't just learning to read, learning math skills or learning to write. It's also the skills about building relationships which are hugely important to their ability to cope in their world. The quality and stability of relationships with those around them during their early years are fundamental in laying the foundation for a successful outcome in many areas. Next slide, please. These areas include self-confidence, mental health, motivation to learn, achievement in school and later in life, successful conflict resolution, knowing the difference between right and wrong, developing and sustaining positive relationships, just to name a few. So the question that then comes to mind is, how can we assist the child in developing these skills? Next slide, please. The answer is so-called serve and returns. What does that mean? Could you bring the next slide, please? Or is it delayed? <laughs> so. Back and return means the back and forth interactions and turn taking conversations between the child and those around them. Look at this photo. <laughs> Imagine the baby is making a bit of noise, banging her hands on the floor and the mother banging her hands on the floor and making a comment. That's a big noise, isn't it? And smiling, making eye contact and thus encouraging the baby to do it again. Research has shown that these serve and returns help to provide the basis for these important relationships. They are stimulating and strengthening the brain architecture and supporting the development of social and communication skills. Next slide, please. Building on serve and returns, the quantity of words and the number of turns a child is exposed to up to the age of three years has a big influence on the activation of the language center. Interestingly, cognitive scientists have found that the number of conversational turns between an adult and a child is even more critical to language development and has a stronger impact on brain activation than the number of words heard. When we think about quality, it can refer to both the complexity of the language used as well as how well the child hears the words. Next slide, please. In order to profit from 
all available surf and returns and assist the child's development, children with hearing loss need, first of all, early detection and intervention in case of a hearing loss. A systematic audiological diagnosis and assessment is needed to know as exactly as possible about the individual hearing loss. With an adequate hearing device selection, we can ensure that the child will receive clarity and richness of sound. The fitting has to be done using proper verification and doing meaningful validation. Let's have a closer look into all these topics with the next slide, please. Proper diagnosis includes both so-called objective, which means electrophysiological tests, as well as subjective or behavioral tests. I personally prefer talking about passive versus active tests, or in other words, tests where the child doesn't need to interact and tests where we expect some activities from the child to check if and how the child is able to react to sounds. Both testings is equally important and furthermore will be used to cross-check the results to find the individual hearing threshold of each child. Finally, any hearing aid fitting will be based on those first thresholds, so they need to be as precise as possible. Next slide, please. Hearing aids for children must be reliable, colorful and safe. Ear molds must be of a high quality and physically well fit, so that the child will accept wearing them all day long. We need to provide clear, rich sound and as much audibility as possible. If a child cannot hear specific high frequency sounds, frequency lowering should be applied. A child is not a small adult. Therefore, children need child appropriate functionalities which differ in many ways from adult versions. An evidence-based automatic system, which is designed for children's very special listening environments, will maximize the hearing performance in any situation. Today, in our more and more digital world, hearing aids also need to connect to smartphones and many other devices. A very convenient innovation are rechargeable hearing aids. Just think about a very small children with rechargeable solutions, there's no more risk of swallowing the batteries. And also the design needs to meet some specific requirements and I'll come to this in a minute. Next slide, please. A big challenge for everybody with a hearing loss is hearing over distance and hearing in situations with a lot of background noise. Hearing aids work very well. They offer features for better speech, intelligibility, even in noise. But especially for children, this is not enough. Just imagine the situation in a classroom. There's a lot of noise and often the distance between the child and the teacher can be much more than two meters. The best solution to overcome issues like distance and noise are remote microphone technologies. The child is wearing his, hers hearing aids with Roger receivers and the teachers, no, please uh, go back to the sli previous slide. And the teachers are shown in this uh, photo, the parents and the sister are wearing remote microphones. The mother here is wearing a Roger pen and the father and sister are using clip on microphones. Those microphones pick up the voices and transmit them directly into the boy's hearing aids so that he will not miss a single word. Now the next slide, please. Behind the ear hearing aids are the preferred solution for kids because they offer the highest number of options, including Roger access. In the ear hearing aids are not recommended. First of all, children grow rapidly so that the ear molds must be replaced very often. With an ITE where the whole technique is built in a custom-made shell, this means that the child will be without hearing for several days or even weeks, which is a big disadvantage. They will miss a lot. Every day without hearing will delay the development of a child. 
Hearing aids should be as small and light as possible. The latest products, which have Roger Direct abilities, are much smaller and lighter than previous models. Water-resistant devices, IP68 rated, are important as they provide a high level of reliability and are very robust to stand up to the wet and wild world of active kits. They are safe thanks to new tamper-proof features and they offer indicator light, which is clearly visible and informs parents and caregivers about the status of the hearing aid. Next slide, please. Verification is a must. Pediatric clinics need to have the appropriate equipment and must do real ear measurement to fit hearing aids precisely and also to monitor their performance over time. When a child is growing up, the ear acoustics will change and the audiologist has to track the changes and adapt the hearing aids frequently. We also need to talk to the parents and or caregivers and ask for their feedback. There are questionnaires to work through and to make sure that our hearing aids are providing all necessary information so that the child can develop age-appropriate speech and language skills. Next slide. The parents must always be in the mind of the professionals. To support parents, there's a lot of information available and on our websites, children and families can find many resources. We want to ensure that parents who just discover their child has a hearing loss can easily access information. What is hearing loss? Why hearing is essential for a child's brain development? Why a mild or unilateral hearing loss cannot be ignored and much more. Next slide. We have been partnering with Manila Hearing Aid for many years and we strongly believe that the children of the Philippines are in good hands. I am looking forward to certifying the Manila Pediatric Center in the nearer future to become an international approved pediatric hearing center. With this approval, we will confirm that all necessary services like rooms and equipment, specialized audiologists, marketing initiatives and multidisciplinary teamwork are in place. Next. In summary, early detection and intervention in case of a hearing loss is key. Well-trained and specialized audiologists must fit hearing aids according to state-of-the-art pediatric fitting protocols using verification and validation. Everyone around the child must make sure that he, she is wearing and using their hearing solution consistently all day long. Parents need to be motivated to interact with their child as often as possible. And again, we really have got the best technology in our hands to provide and enhance all, the point, all of the points I just mentioned. With all of this, we can ensure optimal speech and language development for each of our little patients and a successful and happy future for the families. Thank you very much for listening. Now our discussion has come to an end. But still, it delights me to have everyone here listening to this topic and I hope this live session has given you better ideas and great insights about the hearing healthcare needs of your children. Once again, thank you for making time to be with us tonight and now let's hear from Doc Joel. Thank you, Ms. Barbara. Manila Hearing Aid is also grateful to have you tonight. I just want to share, in the Philippines, the newborn hearing screening test carried out soon after birth can help identify most babies with significant hearing loss. Also, hearing screening as a preschool requirement can also help pick up any problems that have been missed or undiagnosed for many months. And this is important because treatment is more effective if any problems are detected and managed accordingly early on. That is why pediatricians in the Philippines encourage parents to better understand their children's hearing and the milestones for their speech language development. Let's say if a child is noted to have a delay by four months compared to the normal speech and language developmental milestones, then the pediatricians here recommend to have the child's hearing tested by a healthcare professional. Also, there are a number of factors indicating that 
child a child may be at risk of hearing loss such as again the failure of newborn hearing screening or if there is a family history of hereditary sensory neural hearing loss and as we know said uh, and since sensory neural hearing loss cannot be treated with medicines then children with this type of loss will benefit from hearing aid amplification or in some cases by cochlear implants therefore providing hearing impaired children with quality hearing solutions from an early age is essential for the development of speech communication as well as, as well as the child's social skills okay so we will now proceed to our live question and answer session with our guest speakers just a quick guide we will show questions one at a time on the screen and our speakers will answer them there will be questions for Dr. Angelo Monroy and there will be for Miss Barbara. So let's make this question and answer brief and fun, but rich in information. So, so to all our viewers tonight, pay attention and take down notes. Okay. Sorry, I, I I can't read the question. Um oh. okay, so the first question is uh uh when do you recommend a child to have their hearing uh tested? What do you think is the most obvious sign we should take them to an audiologist or ENT? Okay, I think uh, let's ask first Dr. Angelo Monroy uh, for his opinion, and then uh, Miss Barbara Munch. All right. So, uh, Angelo, when do we? What is the obvious sign that we should take them to okay. an so, ENT? Of course, when that's why the newborn hearing screening was set up here in our country because uh, you know hearing loss is one of the more common congenital defects that one could encounter. Uh, far more than you know the down syndrome or even the cleft lip palate and of course hearing loss may not be clinically obvious when they're babies that's why when you screen them uh when you're able to detect it a lot earlier you're able to do something a lot earlier and you save the child from having a speech delay or even other problems later in in their lives uh uh, before the newborn hearing screening was implemented uh the average age of Patients who were detected to have hearing loss was about two to three years old. But when the newborn hearing screening was implemented, our detection went down to about zero to three months. So it's a big difference. And of course, for those people, because not everybody here in the country was able to undergo the newborn hearing screening, despite being a uh, uh, universally uh, implemented uh, procedure already by, by our government, uh, for those that don't, actually, science of hearing loss is actually uh, when when the, the the child is not developing speech properly. That's one. When when babies they don't get startled for loud sounds. Uh, when uh, kids complain of like ringing ears. When kids complain about uh, having you to repeat your your answers to them. Uh, these are clinical signs that they may be having hearing loss, and of course you have to test them to be sure as soon as possible but preferably for the babies before uh, speech development occurs and also um, uh, miss barbara munch your opinion regarding or what is the obvious sign we should that we should take into an audiologist usually i mean first of all i i fully agree what um, dr monray was saying as early as possible, we must keep in mind that all those first screenings are not necessarily a precise indicator for a hearing loss. So parents must further watch out their child. And many parents got a good guess feeling if the child is not reacting to sounds. And I mean, a baby, this is, this is far <laughs> beyond any speech development. If a baby is not reacting to sounds, that must be a first alert 
that the parent go and see a specialist just for confirmation that maybe the child was uh, not reacting of any other reason but uh, the the parents if they uh, they have a kind of sensitivity and uh, when they feel something is wrong they should go for further testing and to those uh, simple signs calling the name when the baby cannot or, the or the child cannot see the person and the baby is not reacting. These are these first uh, indicators uh, that maybe we should have a closer look. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Barbara. So for our second question. Okay, okay. this is in Tagalog. Baganda yan, Doc. Dapat talaga ipacheck natin ang mga newborn natin para malaman natin kung may problema sa pandinigya niya. Okay. Yes, I agree. As mentioned, uh, as, as mentioned also by Dr. Angel and and Miss Barbara, that um, if there's a delay in the development and the speech developmental milestones, then it's a obvious sign that the patient or the child should be brought to an ENT and an audiologist for testing and for confirmation. Now, for uh, the next question, can we please? Uh, Post here the next the next question. Okay. Uh, good evening. A child I know could still not talk, and he's already two years old. Do you think he is hearing impaired, or should I go to another doctor first? Doctor. Okay. Uh, so for for a child, he's two years old, not able to talk. But if you see him listening to something, typically nowadays they, they tend to watch something with their with tablets. Uh, it means they're hearing something or when they get startled from loud noises, it's an indicator that there's an intact hearing. But of course, these are just clinical signs. You have to test them to be sure. And aside from hearing, that's why uh, some patients don't, don't talk because they might have other problems such as uh, developmental delay or even autism so you have to be seen by other specialists as well uh, specifically developmental pediatricians that's why when you approach hearing loss it's not only about having a single doctor or a single specialty addressing it but it's a cooperation of all the various uh, medical and allied specialties uh, for that particular case okay so thank you, Dr. Monroy. So for the fourth question, uh, please pose here the question. Okay, so the fourth question, um, how to better introduce hearing aids to kids? Um, Ms. Barbara? <laughs> As it, it always depends on the age. The younger the child, the earlier we give them a hearing solution in case of a hearing loss, the more they will accept hearing solution because uh, uh, small children very much enjoy being uh, able to hear the world. When the hearing loss is detected later so that the children might maybe refuse hearing aids, you can work with colors. So on purpose, I was pointing out the hearing aids for children must be reliable, safe, powerful and colorful because color gives them a much better acceptance. And if the child is even older, hearing loss can start at any age, uh, then you can start with, imp with going for the features. Look, you have small computers uh, in your ears now, you can connect your hearing aids with your mobile phones and tablets. So uh, it's uh, very age dependent what kind of uh, features and benefits uh, would attract children and convince them to use the technology. So thank you. So for the next question, Okay, the fifth question is, is related to the fourth question. So how young can kids wear hearing aids, Miss Barbara? You, do you mean per day or, I mean, hearing loss uh, generally is something uh, which now I will be healed finally in many, in many, many cases when it comes to sensorineural hearing losses. And we recommend 
wearing the hearing aids as much as possible consistently. However, sometimes when, when children start wearing hearing instruments, it can be that uh, going to school, they are very fatigued, so that they also must have a chance during the day saying, now I need a break. And they indicated at home to the family saying, okay, one hour or two without amplification to have a rest and then wearing them again. But finally, as much as possible. Okay, thank you. So for the next question, um, oh wait, okay, sorry, uh, the, the font is too small. Okay, then. Okay, the question, um, my child failed his newborn hearing screening test twice. We were recommended to take the ASSR and ABR right away. Um, they were done during his second month with right ear mild hearing loss. He also took tympanometry on his third uh, month with bilateral mild hearing loss result. Is there a chance that he will outgrow these results? By the way, my baby is 33 weeks premature baby. Miss um, um, Barbara? Sorry, I didn't get the question complete. So the, the child failed the neonatal hearing screening and yes. was recommended for a, a yes. more, more detailed diagnosis. That's yes. for sure the, the next step to make sure and to know exactly what's, uh, what's going on. And yes. the other part of the question? Uh, actually, the question, the other part, well, he's, uh, the mother said... Well, he took uh, tympanometry on his third month with with bilateral mild hearing loss. So probably the the ASSR and ABR. The, 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 the question says: Is there a chance that he will outgrow these results? By the way, my baby is thirty three weeks premature. So probably, that's maybe a more medical question. Uh, yes, let's maybe um, Doctor Doctor Angelo. All right, so I, I, I think our patient got confused with the result because when you see tympanometry, it's about measuring your middle ear pressures. It wouldn't tell you if you had like a hearing loss or not. Maybe uh, this is what we do because uh, sometimes uh, prematurity can actually um, trigger like uh, abnormal results from your uh, ABR, but on the third month, uh, that's what we would typically recommend for, for probably a better accuracy where your hearing organs are already mature. So if you had tested to even have like a mild hearing loss, well, at least it's good. Uh, you, 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 you don't have like a profound hearing loss, which would really uh, uh, have an impact on speech development. And uh, to, to the question that if he will outgrow hearing loss, you know, if it's a sensory neural problem, one thing bad about a, a nerve problem is that uh, they don't typically recover. Uh, if ever you are able to regenerate nerve, it's just too slow to be clinically significant. So when you get tested with, with a buyer or ABR and you have like significant loss seen, meaning you have like a profound loss, uh, it is very likely it's going to be Permanent. So you try now uh, in aiming for hearing rehabilitation, specifically uh, about uh, cochlear implants, uh, because uh, there's very little chance that you might outgrow them. If, if ever uh, you get tested, uh, you have like a mild hearing loss, maybe you have follow up uh, audiometric exams, even like behavioral audiometry uh, for smaller children. They, they, they are able to monitor whether you, you, you are having improvement in your hearing, but this would typically pertain on conductive hearing losses, which is typically more uh, recoverable or, or, or more or less temporary. If you resolve the conduction problem, you are able to bring back the patient to a normal hearing level. But sensory neural hearing loss, it's unfortunate that if it's gone, usually it, it's, it would last them their lifetime. 
Yes, I agree. If it's sensory neural, it's usually it's permanent. Okay, so it's very it's important to uh, diagnose medically and do the necessary audiological testing. Okay, so for the next question, um, please uh, please post here the next question. Okay, so what what are the important features of hearing aids for kids, Miss Miss Barbara? Having uh, having nice having good. Uh, the external features, the mechanical features, uh, tamper-proof and all those security options, but definitely delivering a nice and a great quality. Audibility will be key. That's uh, why I was outlining frequency lowering techniques, if applicable and if available in the hearing aid. Good noise. Uh, Reduction, ideally an automatic system, what is in place in, for instance, the phonak hearing aids and automatic functionality to make sure that, the, that the, the child can hear and understand speech even in more complex and difficult environments. Roger access means the access to remote microphone technology is very important so that the child always has the best possible signals available. If, if I may add, I think yes? uh, connectivity, because nowadays there's a lot of like online classes Activities for, also, yeah. for, for many students. I mean, instead of like listening over headphones, you could actually get your sound directly into your hearing aids more convenient okay. thank you so for the next question please post here the, the next question Okay, so I think we're having technical problems. Um, okay, I'll go, I'll, I'll go read the question they sent me through text. Okay, so are children's ears sensitive to noise? Do you recommend them using ear mops in some environments? I think this was mentioned by Dr. Munroy, right? Well, uh, for me, as long as the the sound, there's no like prolonged exposure to the noise, it should be okay. But of course, if if there was a prolonged exposure, uh, having some ear kind of ear protector would, would be good. But uh, as I see it on, on, on a practical basis, why put a kid in a noisy environment? Uh, like, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking maybe the, the child is near a construction area. There's like a lot of jackhammering. I mean, you should really, it, it, it's so obvious that you have to avoid that. Uh, when kids study, you have to be in a quiet environment. So uh, I, I don't think wearing an earmuff would be a really practical thing. Kids would tend to remove them. And sometimes even a single exposure to a very loud sound can actually damage your hearing already. Um, but uh, environmental noise, you know, it's really a problem. So it's really best to to stay in a quiet area yes also i i i you you mentioned that uh, we should follow the rule of 60s uh, no yeah, more uh, than 60 minutes for, no more than 60 decibels yeah for for spe especially for like headphones or earphones uh actually both will actually do damage as long as you are listening to them like for more than uh, 85 decibels so the general rule is uh, you just maximize the volume at 60%. Uh, I think some devices have like a, a hearing protection mechanism. You could turn that on. But this is the thing. If you are listening with your headphone or earphone in a noisy environment, you won't hear that 60%. So then as your, your, your patients would tend to um, increase the volume to damaging levels. So uh, there's two strategies. One, either you get a noise isolating or a noise canceling headphone or earphone so that when you use them, there's a more tendency for you to use a lower volume. 
And when you uh, listen, um, make sure you're you're not doing it for a long period of time. Uh, in in our time when we were younger, we used to uh, use the Walkman. Uh, those batteries wouldn't last more than two hours, so uh, we're maybe we're protected during that time. But nowadays. There are devices that keep on going and they keep on turning out sounds more than 100 decibels and some kids sleep on them so it, it's a big big problem by the time you remove them their ears are ringing their ears feel a little bit full so these are signs that there may be already some hearing damages going on okay thank you so much dr munroy so to conclude the question and answer here's our last question for tonight um for children with mild hearing loss, will you recommend the use of hearing aids if he has articulation problems, Ms. Barbara? Absolutely. I mean, a hearing loss, which is for adults, uh, just mild, my, might mean a lot for the child and its individual development. And the articulation problems might be a real indicator that the hearing loss must be treated. So definitely, yes. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Barbara. Um, while we cannot accommodate all your questions tonight, the remaining ones will be featured on our social media pages on the following days. Once again, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to work with you, Dr. Angelo Monroy and Ms. Barbara Munch. And to all our viewers who stayed with us from start to finish, thank you for joining us. We are hoping that this episode gave you more reasons to see how essential it is to learn deeper about pediatric hearing care. Also, we want this to serve as one of the avenues to establish sense of urgency for everyone to see how this can help support the lives of young Filipino children in our country. Thank you, and until our next episode, Here to Aid. Good night, everyone. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Monroy. Thank you, Ms. Barbara Munch. Thank you, Dr. Joel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Barbara.